I'm going to share my screen with the presentation. Yes, I'm ready. Hello, everybody. Hello. All right. Are you oh, perfect? Oh. Okay, Dokes, the floor is yours, Charito. Oh, my God. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charito Morales. Um, and I'm here to present, I'm gonna be like basically the host of the event. So, uh, tomemos un café, let's have a coffee. Um, why we're here today, uh, like I mentioned to you guys before, um, we're gonna follow the slides, instructions already are being um, in place. And I'm trying to get the presentation on my phone just to go over what we went through. But um, yes, so we're gonna have a game. And the game is, I'm Charito Morales, I am a community organizer um, and also an advocate in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, most likely I work um, in, the, in the Kensington, Fur Hill, and Harrogate area. And we are going to have a community building game. This is what it is. So it's basically um, I'm go, let go. This is really easy. So. Uh, something positive is to have a new position in a new uh, nonprofit organization in the city of Philadelphia. And I'm really excited and happy. Um, and one thing that I would like to let go uh, from me, it's something negative is I want to be over with the quarantine and the COVID-19 restriction. And I wish everything comes back to normal. Uh, right, what is going to be so called normal. And in the future, what I would like to accomplish, Charito would like to be the next mayor of the city of Philadelphia. That's awesome, right? <laughs> so, yes. So um, I'm going to call somebody, and the next person is going to do the same thing you call the next person, like that the next person can do the introduction. Who you are, como te llamas, como, cuál es tu nombre, what's your name? Uh, something positive something that you want to let go of, and what you want to accomplish in the future. That's a big example, right? So I'm going to call Ron. All right. Thanks, Charito. Good to be here. So my name is Ron. Uh, one positive thing about myself, hmm, I guess I'm pretty flexible when it comes to different situations. So <clears throat> I feel like I'm able to weather these different uh, things that are going on. You know, I can kind of roll with the punches if I have to. One thing you want to let go of, <laughs> just drama in general, drama in life, drama I've been having recently. I want to let go of that. Uh, one goal you have for the future. I think one goal I have for the future is to start my own community farm or, or plot. I've been thinking about doing that. Um, or at least having a plot in this neighborhood where I can grow my own food. I do want to do that. And I will call on Adriana. Hi. Um, my name is Adriana. What is positive? Um, I am very optimistic about everything. I think I always look at things with a very optimistic point of view. Um, something I want to let go of is, um, just being lazy to do like art stuff after work, getting tired after work and just, I want to get back into like being productive. Um, and one goal for the future is to, I really want to design an exhibit in the Met and I want it to be on Ramar Bearden's collages, so. That's like a very specific goal. And I'll call on Lillian. Hi, my name is Lillian. And one positive thing about me is that I never give up. I'm a fighter. And one thing I would like to let go is not being sick. And my goal for the future is to continue helping um, my community and, and also the school that I, the school. And I call it Agnes. 
Hola, me llamo Agnes Okovic. Algo positivo de mí. Eh, ser, ser siempre humilde, como soy. Lo negativo, el miedo. Tengo mucho miedo de muchas cosas que tengo que dejar eso. Y mi meta para algún futuro muy cercano sería eh, tener mi propia fábrica de sofrito. <ríe> oh, gosh. Uh, Gamal. Hi, Agnes. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Just quickly, Agnes said she wants to be humilde, as in, um, I, I skipped that word. Oh, my God. Humble. humble. She wants to be humble. She wants to stop being afraid of things. And uh, her future goal is to have her own um, fa um, uh, com uh, a space to make sofrito. She said fabrica, which is like a... Um, um, manufacture. Manufacture her own sofrito. <laughs> manufacture her own sofrito. My name is Damar Markarian. And something positive about me is also, I'm going to piggyback off of uh, what Lillian said. I also never give up. I've been fighting all my life, so I want to keep doing that. And uh, something negative that I want to get rid of is I have a lot of anxiety and depression issues that I really, really want to get rid of because it it's, gets in the way sometimes. And something that I'm trying to build in the future is um, also have a little space to make food, but not only a restaurant that sells food, but also a restaurant that allows me to talk about you know things like um, what type of food we eat how we preserve culture how we share culture and I'm going to popcorn it to I can't see the names um, uh, I'm going to popcorn it to Shari because I know Shari <laughs> I can't see anybody else's name <laughs> okay so I'm Shari um, a positive thing about me is I have an amazing amount of energy I'm grateful for And one thing I want to let go of is um, working quite so much. And a goal I have for the future is um, I really want to become a better farmer. I'm like a really, I'm a hack farmer and I want to become a better farmer. Um, so, um, one second, I'm, I'm sorry for the, the interruption. If you are not speaking right now, please mute your microphones like that. We don't have a background sound. Thank you, Sherry. Okay, I'm gonna um, call on Ellie Matthews, who I don't know who is. Hi, I'm Ellie. Um, I work with Stasia at ASE, so thanks for including me. Um, one thing I like about myself, um, I'm a really good baker, I think, and And it's a way that I um, share love and um, sweet things with people to, to show I care. I think the flip side of that and one thing I'd let, like to let go of is um, feeling like I need to please everyone all of the time, which is not possible and um, just takes up a lot of my brain space trying to figure out how to do it. Um, and um, everyone's had these really lofty goals for the future and you're inspiring me, but um, one goal I have for the future, I'm transitioning back into doing more work from home and I just want to like establish a really good routine because that's, I think, what um, helps me stay positive and, and mentally healthy. Um, and uh, Stasia, I know you're here, so I'll call on you. Thanks, Ellie. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Stasia Montero. Um, I work at ASE as the MAC Program Director. Um, one thing that's positive about me is that I am I'm um, sort of a, I embrace being a lifelong learner, so I love um, approaching things with curiosity and, um, and learning from everyone I meet. Um, one thing I'd like to let go of is sort of like compulsively overthinking or just like, you know, getting into negative thinking cycles, um, which can happen when I'm just feeling really stressed. Um, and then one goal I have for the future, um, I'm about to be a first time homeowner and I am really excited to start my own garden. So looking forward to that, um, I'm very excited to learn and, um, I will pass the introductions to Nadia or Nadia. How do you pronounce that? Hey, you know, Nadia is fine. That sounds good. Good. Um, I'm Nadia. Um, I work at Neural Arts. Um, one positive thing, um, I am 
very organized, but one thing I would like to let go of is being so beholden to my list and my organization and being more flexible. Um, one goal for the future, this is very just outside of work, outside of any kind of personal goal is there is a little bookshop in Scotland that you can sign up for as an Airbnb. So you can take over the bookshop for a week and live over it. And I would love to do that. The list for that is about, you know, two years long, but it would be amazing because I would love to own my own, own bookshop, but this would be great to do it for just a week. Oh, and I will pass it to, um, I saw uh, Isaac's on the chat, so I'll pass it to Isaac. I think her name is uh, Rosa. Uh, Miss Rosa, I think I think you're up. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, hi. We Ms. can hear you. Hi, Rosa. Hi, how are you? We're doing great. Good. So, Rosa, uh, um, we are doing the introduction. Uh, you can do it in Spanish and English, uh, whatever you feel comfortable. And the first thing, what's your name? Um, second, what is positive thing about yourself? Uh, third is what you want to let go. And what is your goal in the future? Okay. Um, I can start now? Yes. Okay. Hi, um, Rosaline Isaac. Um, I work at Cramp. Um, the family peer is there. Um, and my goal is to have the garden look more beautiful. <laughs> um, and a goal, I guess, for the future, um, I guess, for to the home. Great. Uh, now yeah. I know you cannot see the computer. Uh, yeah. Well, we have a couple of people that you can call. They hasn't participated yet in introducing themselves. So, uh, we have Linda, Keisha, Kate, Pamela. Which one would you like to call? Um, doesn't matter. Well, you have to say one. Linda, uh, I, will, I will say Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi, She's everyone. online or? Hello, my name is Linda Fernandez. One positive thing about me is that I spend a lot of time in nature and I love to go on walks in the woods and love to bring people with me. Um, one thing I want to get rid of, let go of, is stress and anxiety. Just trying to um, try and relax more and go with the flow. And then one goal that I have for the future is I want to start sewing again. I just got a sewing machine. I used to sew a lot and I want to get back into making things that I can share with people and, and um, maybe start a, a little side business. I will pass it to, um, let's see, uh, Kate. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Kate Jacoby. I'm a project manager at Mural Arts. Um, one positive thing about me is I'm very resourceful and a very creative problem solver. Um, and I like to help people, but one of the things I want to let go of is my inability to kind of say no and I end up over committing myself and stretching myself too thin. Um, so I still want to help people, but I just have to be more mindful of what my capacity is sometimes. Um, and a goal I have for the future, which I'm excited about, um, is to work on planning my gardens uh, for the spring. I have moved like a year and a half ago, but I keep missing the garden cycle. And when I was ready to start in the spring, late winter, it was right around COVID and I got sucked into a lot of um, rapid response work and didn't get a chance to plan a garden this year. So I'm really excited to do that. Um, for 2021 and I love um, having that thing to have to tend to every day and work on the garden and water it and I feel like it really helps keep a balance of um, self-care as well so I'm excited for that. Um, I will call on Pamela. 
Was that Pamela? Did you say Pamela? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that was an affirmative Pamela. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, y'all. I um, I'm hearing impaired, and I read. I mostly read lips, so I wasn't quite sure if I heard that right. My name is Pamela Draper. Good evening. I work for Mural Arts as, as the program manager for the Kensington storefront. Um, okay. One positive thing about myself, I would say, is my creativity. I really love uh, music and, and singing and poetry, and I like finding. Uh, I like challenges that require thinking outside the box, I guess. Something I want to let go of is, I guess, anything that um, tries to keep me from prioritizing my physical health, because health really comes first, and that can be tough when you're busy, and that's what I need to do right now. And one goal I have for the future is uh, learning Spanish. I'm making very small strides, but it's, it's a beautiful language, and I'm doing my best. I will call on um, Kesha. Hi, everybody. I'm Kesha, and I'm here with my son. So if you hear him, he's just a little baby trying to be part of the conversation. Um, one positive thing about me, I'd like to say that I'm pretty, um, how do I want to say it? Very intentional about how I try to do my task daily, which I feel is really good for like problem solving and just living in general. Um, one thing I want to let go of are fears of being a new mom. It's my first time and there's a lot of questions. Um, and one goal I have for the future. It's okay, mister. <laughs> one goal that I have for the future is just to read more. I feel like I fell off of that since we've been locked down. All right, everybody, we have to continue with the agenda. Uh, we're going to continue introducing ourselves at the end, or you can put your name uh, and your information in the chat. I will appreciate it. So I'm going to pass it on to, if I'm not mistaken, Gamar. Yeah, I just wanted to introduce the agenda real quickly so we get the information. We want to go through the a little bit about the history of redlining with Ron White and Charito and then um, have a very quick breakout uh, uh, group for reflections and then we come back for more set, more conversations on greening our neighborhoods with um, Keisha, tree tenders and community design leaders Agnes and Lillian and then we do a little breakout group and we come back to talk about the Fair Hill Slow Zone by Team Naz and then if we have time for discussion and sharing a little bit about the highlights of our breakout rooms I just wanted to say, if you have a moment, just write your um, name in the chat box, your affiliation and the language that you are comfortable speaking, but I, uh, because we want to pair people uh, up with Spanish English to help each other. So if you have a moment to do that on the chat box. And also, I just wanted to introduce very quickly, the, um, this uh, presentation is within the context of the Kensington Wellness Initiative. Um, here's, a de uh, here's a description in Spanish, but I'm going to read it in English as well. So the Kensington Wellness Initiative at Mural Arts is an effort to address trauma, cultivate wellness, and strengthen community capacity in Kensington, Fairhill, and Harrogate. And Mural Arts is best equipped to respond to the needs of the area through multi-site strategy, and it relies on the expertise of the several departments at, the, um, uh, at Mural Arts, and we believe that developing a collaborative approach uh, such as this will result in positive investments, strategic participant um, engagement, strengthened community networks, and a more robust learning culture among our community networks, but also among the staff and the partners at Mural Arts. And um, at, the, um, at the end of this year, we want to design a community building game, which is a board game designed as an exploration into community capacity building, network building, and making community-driven investments. And I hope everybody here gets to play the game. And uh, when we say community investment game, we are talking about uh, working towards uh, neighborhood yes funds, which a neighborhood yes funds provide support for projects initiated by neighborhood residents that have um, positive impact and change in the neighborhood. So I am going to pass it on to um, Ron, who is our first um, presenter on redlining and the effects on our neighborhoods. All right, thanks, Gamar. 
Um, so yeah, my name is Ron White. I'm the project coordinator for uh, Trash Academy. And normally when we give presentations, the uh, issue of redlining comes up in connection with uh, why do some neighborhoods have so much trash um, while other neighborhoods do not. So I think that's where we wanna start. Um, oh, and thanks for including this slide. I know this is really last minute. Um, I just heard that uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz has just finished, finished her latest book. And this is the title of her book. And I wanted to include this because uh, what I'm really concerned about here is the terms erasure and exclusion and how uh, that's connected with redlining and how we can't talk about redlining without talking about um, these other big topics like settler colonialism, white supremacy, so forth and so on. Um, so I really am looking forward to reading this book when it comes out. But just keep in mind that when we're talking about redlining, we're talking about all of these different issues. Okay, thank you. So if you live here in Philly, I'm sure this is something that you have come across. You, you go into one neighborhood and it looks like the bottom, the bottom, bottom right. And you go maybe 10, 15 minutes away and it looks like a totally different country. Um, myself personally, I grew up in a neighborhood that looks more like the bottom right. So I'm very like viscerally connected to this issue and really uh, growing up trying to understand, you know, um, why do some people get to live in nice, well-managed, aesthetically pleasing, um, pretty clean neighborhoods and other people have to live in these rat infested, crime infested, drug infested neighborhoods. And I think it's, you know, we have to understand that people who are living in these underserved neighborhoods are mostly hardworking, family oriented, law abiding residents, and that uh, people are not stuck in poverty because um, they're lazy or unmotivated. But it's because of historical crimes like redlining. And I, I think it's important to say that, that, that this was a crime, what happened. Um, and although redlining was technically legal at the time, we should view it as a crime against uh, vulnerable populations. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, it's very difficult to talk about redlining without going into a little bit of detail about uh, what happened with the history of this country. We have to view redlining as basically just another mechanism for erasure and exclusion of non-white populations and for controlling spaces and resources and controlling who gets to live where. It's also about who has value and who does not have value or who is valued less. So uh, redlining is part of the larger history of colonialism. Um, most natives have been pushed off of valuable land and onto desolate reservations, or they have just been disenfranchised as uh, a tribe altogether and just totally lost their land. So this happened through open violence, and this also happened through the colonial legal system, which is where redlining comes into play. And just to, uh, next slide please, just to make a, 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 you know, a fine point on this about how this whole system is about controlling resources, this map shows uh, how Africa was partitioned by the European powers um, between 1885 and 1914. So redlining is part of a culture of controlling and dominating people in space again with historical roots. I'm sorry, can someone read the what, what just came up in the chat? I missed it really, really fast. Let me see if I can pull that up. Title of the book, I'll send it in the chat. Okay, um, next slide please. So I'm sure uh, you've seen this in history classes. Um, this was very common here in the United States, um, not only in the South, but also in California and Oregon in the North. People wanted whites only spaces. I mean, there's no real way to go around that, that issue. Um, next slide, please. And this is so explicit that they had no shame about putting up these gigantic signs. <laughs> I mean, you look back now and you think, like, how could people, um, how can people uh, think that this is okay just to put up a giant sign saying they just want white people in their neighborhood? But this is how normalized white supremacy was to the point where they can openly say, we only want white people living in this neighborhood, that's it. And so I just wanna read um, how redlining plays and how redlining comes into play here. Mortgages were a lot easier for whites to get because of redlining. Redlining is the practice of denying borrowers access to credit based on the location of properties in minority or economically disadvantaged neighborhoods. This was sanctioned by the Federal Housing Administration policies. Redlining effectively made it more difficult for low-income minorities to buy homes. 
and institutionalized discriminatory lending and government-backed mortgages that reinforced residential segregation in American cities. So basically redlining was just a legal way, like a nice polite legal way of, of having the sign up in front of your, front of your uh, apartment complex. So instead of having the sign, they would just do it in the back rooms, in the banks and amongst themselves behind the scenes. Like they, they didn't have to put these signs up, right? Um, next slide, please. So yeah, ex ex instead of relying on overt racism, the racism of redlining utilized institutions like the banking system to perpetuate rights, white supremacy and white domination of spaces and resources. So down south, I'm, I'm sure many of you heard that um, people were literally driven off of their land by gangs and by uh, you know people burning crosses and people you know terrorizing people and threatening to kill them and people actually being killed and lynched and you know you see this happening you're like oh okay I'm going to get out of here. Um, that was one way of removing people from the land and from spaces. This is a, a way of doing a similar thing, but uh, in, in a much nicer, more polite, more um, institutional way. So it's a different kind of violence. It's, a, it's the violence of uh, institutions, basically. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so if you, if you Google redlining, uh, a Wikipedia article will come up and this is the picture you'll see, a picture of Philadelphia. I mean, that's how extreme the redlining here has been, is that we're almost like the poster child for redlining, right? So in 1968, the Fair Housing Act banned racial discrimination in housing. And yet a 2018 NCRC study confirmed that three out of the four neighborhoods that were redlined on government maps 80 years ago still continue to struggle economically to this day. And I want to pause there uh, reading this quote to say that this is no coincidence. I mean, this is no, oh, I'm at the five minute mark now. Um, let me, can I get like two more minutes? Is that okay? Okay. Um, so let me just keep going. I'm, I, I feel like I'm stopping to make too many comments. Um, I forgot about the time. <laughs> and uh, because our schools are tied so closely to our neighborhoods, the remnants of redlining are still very much alive today. So if you're stuck in a neighborhood with bad schools, bad infrastructure, your whole prospects for the rest of your life are diminished. Uh, next slide, please. So white flight is something that I think uh, definitely plays a part in this whole issue. When people of color began moving into uh, neighborhoods in let's say LA. So let's say in LA, there was a lot of migration from Mexico and South America into LA. They started redlining these communities to make sure that these people would not be moving too close to where they are. So they would flee to the suburbs, they would flee out to the, to the outskirts, um, just to make sure that they would keep, like we mentioned earlier, they're mostly uh, white communities with all of their resources. And then the mostly people of color communities were kind of just left out to fend for themselves. Okay, next slide, please. So communities that were purposefully targeted for disinvestment are now seeing a reverse white flight situation. So uh, decades ago, when people of color were moving into the cities, white people you know, panicked and left. Um, but now these, these communities, especially here in Philly, like certain neighborhoods that are gentrifying, like in West Philly, North Philly, Temple, Penn, Drexel, um, now these are valuable properties again. Now, now people are like, oh, we wanna move back? You want to come back? <laughs> and the people who have been living there for decades, uh, they weren't able to sell their houses decades ago. And now sometimes they're being targeted and preyed upon by uh, predatory lending, things like that. Um, but now I want to pass it to Chorito to give us some more history and some more context to this whole redlining um, issue. Thank you, Ron. That was a great presentation and a great way to me exactly how we live in it what was before and what's going on right now actually into the, our communities in 2020. Um, how, so basically what, what, what Ram was telling us is something that we all know and we should be aware is the rent hikes. So all these investors are coming to our communities for one reason is to pray, to pray of the low income communities to the people that are going through hustles and hoops uh, because the, they cannot purchase a home because they want to, they make sure they pay a lot of money um, instead of like 2% for somebody who's Caucasian 
um, or from Jewish or other communities, uh, we have to pay at least six or seven percent more in taxes to purchase a property, which is bad. So uh, our our community has been declining because a lot of properties have been abandoned or vandalized because it's been, it's been really hard for us to purchase the property because they make us do around and around and around and make it hard for us. And they ask for documents that we don't actually need it to purchase the home. And, and that is, I'm talking on my, on my behalf, that happens to me. Um, why we have a lot of high levels of homelessness into our community? Because some of us cannot afford any more uh, the rent because the investor has come over here, take overs, do all these, uh, gentrify our communities and they raise in the amount of money uh, of how much you are going to pay, right? In, in, in your rent, which is not right. So it's a racially profiling and targeting our communities. So they have abandoned our communities just to sell it to the hires uh, investor. And, and it's creating a lot of issues. What's going on uh, in the community, right? We have a high environmental and health hazard issue. What I'm talking about when it comes to uh, health issues. We didn't have a lot of our uh, green areas, including our trees, have been cut down and removed from the city uh, because they say that our uh, trees have, it was the wrong species. Um, they making a lot of damage to the people properties, to the sidewalks, and to our parking spaces and stuff like that, right? But they didn't replace them. And what happened? That created a heat issue into our communities and besides that, we didn't have a lot of shade. And besides that, a lot of our people come up with a lot of uh, asthma, develop asthma like me. I wasn't born with asthma. I didn't have a respiratory issue when I moved to the United States in Philadelphia. But now I have COPD because the air quality has changed. So what are we doing to change that? We're planting trees, you mean creating programs, we're creating sustainable communities. We're creating more green spaces in the middle of a gentrification, right? So we have another issue besides that hazard. The level of trash, the level of plastics into our sidewalk, into our street, the level of debris from construction, people tossing trash, and the way the city of Philadelphia or all the corporations has a lack of picking up uh, the trash the proper way or how the people dispose the trash in the trash bags how we can improve that, how we can change that. Our community has been targeted and it's, it's, it's the level of not having education of why and how they're creating these issues, right? So and that's bad into our communities. We have to change that. Another issue that we have in our communities is the opium epidemic, the opium crisis. Due to the homelessness, due to the financial solvency, due to lack of higher education or due to, uh, you know, lacks of having access to other resources into our community, we have a big issue, the drug addiction. So we gotta change that. We have to create sustainable communities. We have to work. We have to make sure we create programs. So yeah, basically that's part of the problem. LNG, natural gas, that's another health issue. And it's coming to our communities. And it's right now, our life is, is in danger. They pass in train bumps into our community from the liquid gas um, from New Jersey to uh, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. And they are transporting this liquid gas into our waters, right? And what happened into our waters is going all the way down to Puerto Rico, into our, uh, our south side of the island, without people knowing why we need uh, the liquid gas to create, right, energy, but we have other ways of doing it. So this is an environmental hazard. It's an environmental issue. This is something that we have to keep the eye and look out closely because they are transporting these train bombs into the community that it can create any disaster any minute. And that is not gonna be nice and good for our health. This has a lot of chemicals, a lot of hazards, and we have to change that. So we have to create a, a potential uh, um, things, you know, to, to change this. So, Liquid gas, um, it's, it's, it's dangerous, you know, it's dangerous. So we're bringing this to your, you know, attention and we have to speak about that. We have to create awareness into the communities, Spanish, English, um, uh, um, all the, you know, different languages. 
for people to understand how we can come up together as a community and stop this and create changes and create more healthy uh, environments and communities, okay? So uh, it's important that we do that. So I'm gonna pass it on uh, to Gamar if I'm going to break out number one. Yeah, um, so we're gonna have a quick uh, breakout uh, group where uh, we would like uh, you to answer how does the presentation make you feel? What does, uh, what does it make you think of? And do you have any stories or experiences in relation to environmental justice? Adriana will copy paste the presentation link into the chat box. So uh, whoever has access to uh, Google Slides, please can you open it because there's a designated space for you guys to, to, to take notes as you answer these questions within each breakout group. And if you don't have access to the, to the, to the Google slides. If you want to write down your answer, snap a picture and send it to Adriana. I believe she also shared her phone number um, in, the, um, in the chat box. Um, and uh, Victoria is going to help us go into our um, uh, breakout groups. Charito, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Mm -hmm. I can see all of you. That was a great breakout. I mean, I don't know. We would get into it, but we would pull out of the conversation. We were just right in the middle. Oh, I think we should have at least one more minute or two. It's okay. Right. We, can, we can catch up. It's yep. okay. We were behind schedule, but let me share the screen again. And uh, uh, this time I'm going to pass it on to Keisha to talk about Okay, experience with PHS tree tenders. So, hi everyone, I'm Keisha. I'm with the Fairhill Tree Tenders um, that's in the vicinity of the Kensington area. And so, um, this presentation is just a short infographic on what PHS tree tenders is and what it is that we do. So, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So, this is our group. We have just recently planted about 100 or something trees this past month in November. So this is our Fair Hills uh, group, which Charito and Stacia were a part of actually. PHS is basically led, um, or the Tree Tenders is led by PHS and it's across the entire city. And there are also places in the country that also have PHS tree tenders. So like, for example, in Florida, we had people that were doing the training with us. And the purpose is to increase the tree canopy coverage in order to <laughs> green the city um, to aid in the shading process so that neighborhoods have a fair chance and actually like recovering from the heat in the summer, for example. Um, also to do beautification projects for not only our mental health, but our actual physical health. Um, and so over the past few years, while PHS tree tenders has been a thing, there have been over 1,500 tree tenders that are certified at this point, which is an amazing feat when you think about how many people are actually looking for programs like this um, and volunteering with them for free. So we plant twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. We always plant bare root trees. And so that's an example of what we were doing in the Lehigh area. So please uh, go to the next slide. This is a short map by the Philadelphia Tree, I forgot the whole name, but it's an assessment report of what the tree canopy has been over the past few years. This is from 2018, so it's the most recent one that I found, but there's, I think there should be another one coming up soon. And it's basically just showing you all the areas where trees have been impacted, either by being cut down and not having any, all of the loss, all of the gains that we've made. And it's not looking too great for the city, but the goal is to, at least through the PHS tree tenders, to have the city be, 30% green instead of 20%, which is said in this slide. And so these are just more of our examples of what our gains have been and what our loss has been through land use. As you can see, agriculture isn't really big in our area. We're a big city, but Pennsylvania as a state is very like rural, but our biggest thing is residential. So a lot of our trees are being lost to residential building or teardowns or just abandonment, which is an extreme thing to think about when you think Think about how much we can do in those spaces and how much these trees can actually affect us in a beneficial way. Um, this is just a quick 
thing. So it's not, there's not much more I can say, but if you want more information, the PHS website is right there and it, took, it takes you directly to the tree tenders um, site. So if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to myself, Charito, um, or just go directly to PHS. Everyone there is pretty wonderful. Yeah, and I want to add something uh, the, about the PHS, and I know we are short of time, but it's been incredible how we engage the community, the residents into our communities and our youth. I know we have to follow the protocols for safety and, you know, the COVID-19 and everything. Well, we had a big group and a lot of people are really, really interested in volunteering because they want to see changes into our community and they want to improve the air quality and the green spaces. So this is a great opportunity and a great example of how we can come up together and work together, just volunteer our time in this time and also a great opportunity to stay away from the house a little bit and take care of our mental stability. So this is all awesome and great and I'm happy to be part of the PHS. And in 2018, that data alone, half of that data came from Fur Hill community people that participate. Kensington students from all broad different high school. So this is a really important data because we was included for the first time in history. Usually it used to be the suburbs, but this, it was all good. And I'm really proud to say that I was part of that change and we're gonna continue to doing so. All right, now we pass it on to community design leaders at CRAM, Agnes and Lillian. Agnes, estás en mute? Sí, yeah. Oh, okay. For Agnes, will be presenting in Spanish, so the English translation is right on the slides. Hola. Eh, ahora vamos a presentar el proyecto que hicimos en la escuela William Cram en el patio del norte y los murales. El proyecto con mural art comenzó con una reunión con los artistas Shari y Marion en la escuela. Luego se unieron otras personas de la comunidad y más artistas del mural art. Así se comenzó planificando todo. Se suponía que debíamos trabajar en el patio de al frente de la escuela, pero en lugar de eso decidimos juntos transformar el patio trasero porque no tenía vida ni color. Lady, Lilian, José y yo nos interesó el proyecto. Queríamos transformar en un espacio para la comunidad donde pudieran sembrar y recolectar y a la misma vez representar la cultura de distintas razas. Logramos comunicar e involucrar a la comunidad para transformar para la transformación del proyecto. Fue positivo esto porque se involucraron maestros, directores, estudiantes, vecinos, y así surgió la idea de cómo transformar el patio y los diseños del mural. La buena razón de colaborar con los artistas fue la creatividad y el trabajo en equipo y las diferentes actividades que se trabajó en los tres años que duró el proyecto. Un ejemplo fue el día que todos nos unimos a sembrar y pintar alrededor de la escuela CRAM. Otro ejemplo fueron las reuniones para que plasmáramos en un libro con nuestras ideas. Cada una de nosotras hizo su labor en un libro Y así nos convertimos en asociados y diseñadores representando a la comunidad. Fue positivo el esfuerzo comunitario porque era algo colaborativo y representó muchas voces de la comunidad porque hay muchos tesoros ocultos en esta comunidad. De esta manera, el patio se puede utilizar para muchos proyectos futuros eh, el mismo proyecto es testigo de que se puede hacer cambios de lo positivo, de lo negativo a lo positivo. Eh, Lilian, ¿tú quieres decir algo? Sí, yo digo algo. Este, um, 
I think this is one of the best programs and one of the best things that happened to us because I've been working as a volunteer more than 20 years at the William Cramp and I never saw a change like this. This was a change for the best because we got to meet a lot of people. Um, we got the kids involved with the planting, the painting, and and the and and the murals that were put in the school. I mean, it was wonderful to see how they participated and how the kids were so excited that they could paint and 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 work with us. So to me, that that was a really great experience. I made new friends. Um, and I mean, it's great. The space looks beautiful. It doesn't look like an old building no more. It has exciting things all, all around it, wherever you go. And most of all, the kids are enjoying it. All right. Thank you so much, Lillian and Agnes and Keisha. Um, we can now go to our maybe slightly longer breakout groups where we are going to answer what are your favorite activities and experiences in green public spaces. We back, we back, we, we back. back. <laughs> See, that was a better time, like frame of time. We got to talk a little bit more and it's uh, so nice and important. I mean, I, ha I think I had the best break, break room. I don't know. I got the girls. <laughs> How was everybody break room? I love mine. <laughs> you like mine too? Yeah, but I got the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dogs, let me screen share quickly. Um, now we have Fair Hill Slow Zone team. All right, my team, Ness. May you add uh, Roviana and Louis, but Louis not here, but Roviana is here. And I think Stacia can help her a little bit, Ellie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw Roviana was on earlier, but I don't see her on now. She might have gotten disconnected somehow. No, Roviana is going through COVID right now and she was doing the best that she could. Okay. Yeah, and I know Lois is not here. Um, so I have not, um, you know, previewed the slideshow, but I am happy to help uh, tell a little bit of how this happened. Um, so yeah, the Fairhill Slow Zone um, basically started in terms of some listening sessions we started conducting back in the fall of 2018 with community members. Um, we collaborated with APM to do some outreach um, on both sides of Lehigh Avenue new and hosted a couple of listening sessions over at Ase's Main Street office, which is at 5th and Lehigh, um, to talk about traffic safety issues. And people um, notoriously were talking about like the road conditions as well as, um, you know, reckless driving and speeding and how it was threatening both seniors and youth. Um, and um, we had some support from the Bicycle Coalition to provide some of the data regarding, um, you know, like what happens when somebody's hit by a car at 20 versus 30 versus 40 miles per hour um, and where are like sort of the high injury networks in the city and we see that they converge in places like Fair Hill um, as well as some other um, generally poor areas of the city. Um, so, you know, basically we had these listening sessions and then uh, later in 2018 the city opened an RFP um, for neighborhoods to apply um, to get uh, $500,000 worth of traffic safety investments to help slow down traffic, um, provide some traffic calming measures, um, and, you know, increase safety on neighborhood streets. So the group decided to, um, you know, go out and collect close to 500 signatures. And you see in this graph that um, there were, I think, 29 applications in total. Um, and we ranked, um, you know, second overall based on a formula, um, but our application had the most signatures of any by far. Um, so it was pretty evident that not only would there be tremendous benefit, um, we focused on, again, second to Fifth Street, um, Allegheny to Glenwood, um, which includes the Rivera Recreation Center. It includes Munoz Marin Elementary School. Um, it also includes um, Maria de los Santos Health Center. Um, and then Brightside Academy Pre-K, um, as well as the uh, Lawrence Court uh, townhomes that Ase developed. Um, I think it's 50 units of affordable uh, for purchase housing 
uh, right in that zone. So um, yeah, the impacts of this development um, and these investments are going to um, support the safety of people who are navigating that area, especially those coming to um, Rivera and Man um, and the schools. Um, and yeah, we'll reduce the speed limit uh, to 20 miles per hour on residential streets. Um, and all of the sort of installations were um, placed through a series of community design sessions um, that we held between, I guess, March and July of 2019. Um, so in that time, uh, we convened community members to identify like where is traffic, um, you know, traffic safety and speeding of the most concern. Uh, where do we need corner clearances to increase visibility? Um, and then, you know, through those design sessions, uh, folks came up with a plan um, that they're hoping will help to mitigate some of those issues and increase safety for people who are walking, biking, playing, um, you know, driving, et cetera, taking public transit. Um, so yeah, um, I guess there's, I don't know, are there any questions or anything I missed, Charito? No, you, you are the best. I just want to add the team NAS um, is, is, it was, it, we are uh, working really hard for this to be happening. Um, West Moreland and Marshall Street and all that area, you guys gonna see a tremendous change coming soon. So that area is gonna be rehabilitated for the kids to walk and the people in the community can commute a little bit more safer, you know. Um, and also we're gonna create conscious to the people and the drivers to start reckless driving. Um, how we started it, it was just an idea. And then the city uh, wanted to hear about the idea. And then we put up together a massive amount of information from all, all everybody in the community. It doesn't matter what language, what ethnicity, what race was. Everybody had a say. It was kind of fun. Uh, it was hard sometimes also to come up with uh, how is it is going to get done. And we, we bring, we, we, we basically present this to the city and the city listening. So now we have what is called slow zero, uh, zero or slow zone. And uh, a lot of the students from Cramp, a lot of the students from <coughs> sorry, Julia de Burgos Elementary uh, and Lehigh and others uh, nearby schools are going to, to feel and see the impact of the slow zone and the addition zero. So with that says, everything uh, is changing for good and for better into our communities. Little by little, uh, we cannot create changes from one day to another. We have to have a lot of patience because it's a lot of process and a lot of hoops, but it's gonna get done. And we as a team NAS and people from the community, we're gonna continue volunteer and we're gonna make sure that we follow step by step and have the changes that it needs to be, just for the safety of our people. Yeah. And two quick notes I can add. Um, so Second Street is a boundary street and was actually outside of the scope of what the slow zone was going to offer. But um, through these sessions, um, neighbors who I'd been working with for years um, were elevating the concerns around speeding traffic on Second Street. And um, through their advocacy and this process, we're able to successfully get speed bumps installed all the way from Lehigh Avenue to the south up, I think, to close to Erie Ave. Um, so that was a huge success. And then, of course, in terms of construction, we were hoping and anticipating that it would start this summer, but with COVID, it's been pushed back. So we are eagerly awaiting news from Otis about when construction will start. Thank you, Stacia. Thank you. Great. And we can now go to our, our third break, final breakout group. And we oh, want to talk wait, about. Kamar, I'm sorry yeah. for the interruption. Sherry just put something in the chat. Yeah. Uh, Stacia can repeat. I'm sorry, it went too fast. Can you repeat what yeah. the factors are that make a neighborhood a site of many accidents? Yeah, um, so I mean, I don't have all the answers to this, but we do notice that there is overlap in um, lower income neighborhoods with a lot of traffic um, incidents. So, um, you know, there aren't as many um, instances of clear signage, right? The striping on the roads might be worn down. The actual conditions of the roads, like potholes and things of that nature, um, might be more um, present and prevalent. And so people might be driving somewhat erratically to avoid damaging their car. Um, and then, yeah, I guess there are probably other stressors that are just kind of the invisible factors that are a part of it as well. Welcome back. Thank you, Charita. 
I think I drink a lot oh, of coffee. No. I have a lot of energy. I'm really happy. I see, I'm happy just to see everybody here and people who actually care for our communities and love our our neighborhood. Hola, no oye. Here, Gamar, we can see you. We can hear you. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> no, I'm leaving the floor to you. You are our um, master no, I, today. Yeah, I just, uh, I want to just, if you guys want to, you know, bring yeah. a feedback from uh, overall the meeting. Um, and also, I want to thank everybody ahead of, of, you know, in behalf of the team. Uh, Shadi, it's been amazing. Um, and thank you for including me in this amazing project. By the way, I would like I would like to hear something from you, Sherry. It's just because I wasn't in your breakout group. I'm really happy everyone's here, and I'm excited about the game we're going to build, the community building game, and the projects the community is going to have access to, and building those to bigger projects that come directly out of the community in the future. So I'm happy we started. It's so nice to see everyone. Thank you. Um, also want to shout out Mr. William Reed, um, the only man in here <laughs> with all these beautiful ladies. Uh, William, how are you? Estoy bien. Yeah. Es un placer estar aquí con ustedes. You know, it's, it's always a pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure to see you, Charito, and Thank you um, for putting this together. I think it's much needed and I think it's wonderful. Um, it's a wonderful presentation and teaching. I can't wait to see uh, where the program goes. And I'm very jealous of your Christmas tree. It's beautiful. So. Thank you. Just bringing the spirit uh, early at home for my grandson. I'm a new grandma. So huh? I'm enjoying that, yes, my daughter Keisha is somewhere there, and and I have you know have the new baby, the new adding to my 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 house and my family. So and for him and for others, I'm working really hard in my community because I want them to enjoy the work that we all are putting out there for them for the next generation. Any feedback, uh, Maribel, um, Stacia, Ellie? Um, Katie, Wanda, Pamela, Linda, Linda is, listen, Linda is really quiet, but Linda is an amazing, amazing artist and a person who's actually creating a phenomenal project coming soon to the community. Thank you, Charito. I'm just really happy to be here. Um, my artist collective, we have a studio in Harrogate, so really just wanting to get more involved in that neighborhood. I live all the way across the city in West Philly, but spend a lot of time in the Fairhill, Kensington, and Harrogate neighborhood. So really would love to hear more about everything that you all are doing. I just want to give thanks to everybody for the work that, they, that, that you're doing, especially to the cramp ladies uh, that have are becoming leaders in their community. That's really good. La señora Janely Torres y la otra señora. Uh, muy bien. Adelante. Go ahead. Keep, keep developing yourself. Thank Gracias. you. And Gracias. I thank you all. Gracias. <laughs> so, yeah, so we keep uh, in touch, uh, everybody. And I hope I see you guys again. Uh, we're going to continue the hard work and the communication. Uh, and providing every little new information, how we're going to create these projects and change it into our community. But I have to shout out to Gamar. Gamar is the rock star. She works really hard. She was making all these changes possible. So Gamar, I'm going to leave the last, the last day on this to you. And thank you very much. Well, the shout out goes to Adriana also. So. <laughs> for translating the whole slide, et cetera, putting this whole thing together so fast. 
Um, what we can do is if any of you have extra notes or things you want to share more, please, you can email both me and Adriana for more reflection. What we can do is we can maybe um, res um, summarize all the notes that we took into an email um, to keep the conversation going so we can send those to you. Um, Adriana, any other words you want to add? <laughs> Well, um, I guess, um, dejando saber si, si sería la translación, la translation, si le gusta um, que todo estaba en español y en inglés, o si prefiere escuchar la presentación en español. La traducción estuvo fenomenal. Muchísimas gracias, Adriana. Definitivamente te votaste. Y fue un equipo bien chévere para trabajar. y Creo que hace una muy buena combinación. So what I'm saying is Adriana Gamar make a real dream team. They work really hard and to make this possible and to help me facilitate uh, and be the host for this presentation. I thank you and we continue to do so. And my grandson is somewhere there. <laughs> yeah, and, and we'll let you know for the second teaching, which is sometime in January, I believe, right? So that we can do. <laughs> Look at my chunk of ball. So hi, everybody. My name is Cairo. And thank you for creating a better future for me. <laughs> OK, so I mean, I'm done for today. And I hope you guys have a great and safe evening. Continue being safe, taking care of your families, and follow the health department protocols and guidelines. Bye. Victoria, Thanks we so can much. see the chat, correct? Sorry, can you repeat that? I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself because I lost the screen. We can uh, save the chat, correct? Just in case. Oh yeah, I've I've.